Welcome, fellow anglers, to the Working Class Fishing Podcast, a place for all anglers, amateur or expert, to share their stories and learn about fishing. Join your hosts, John and Brian, each episode as they debunk the perceived inaccessibility to fishing, break down the barriers of any and all angling methods, and hear stories from other anglers and their own journeys with fishing. Now, let's get this show started. Welcome back to another episode of the Working Class Fishing Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Brian, and here is John with our sponsors. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Um, appreciate everyone listening. This episode of Working Class Fishing is brought to you by Anadromous Fly Company, 317 Flies, Angry Rooster Fly Company, CD Fishing USA, Lid Rig, Mr. Sheer Cure, Naughty Tackle, and Brian, did, did I miss anybody? I think I got everybody this time. I think you did. Oh wow! I've messed hey, up the past. That Andromedus, uh, you know the Andromedus uh, fly tie-in? Yeah, that's Herb Theodore. He's a good friend of mine, and he's got some great products, doesn't he? Yeah, dude. Herb I think he's is, really. He's the man. Know, he's so cool. Dude, what a small world. Yeah. <laughs> no, Herb, Herb's uh, just south of me here, and uh, he's a big sage guy too. So I've I've kind of known him through that avenue for a while. Dude, that's sick. <laughs> well, everybody, if you if you don't recognize that voice, well, you're about to because we have none other than the fish whisperer himself. Also, you know, Matt Sapinski called him the night stalker, the uh the Buddha Truda, and all these other Truda. It is none other than Tommy Lynch. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh. Welcome to our podcast, Tommy. I, I I don't know if you were expecting all of that, but uh, no, kind of... no, that was a pretty fresh uh, incoming there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I believe there was another podcast, and and it had to do with Kelly Gallup, and that we had, we had asked Kelly. I think at some point it was like, oh, the blonde flowing hair. He's like, what in the fuck were you talking about? <laughs> or something you to see that, that effect. Do you see the uh, the 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 one that they just came out with? He's got the open shirt and the guns and the Oh, who did that sticker? They did the best sticker. It's awesome. It's Kelly. It's, and he's got like two guns. You saw that? Yeah, that's uh, that's my buddy Craig Cooper. I love that. Yeah, I yeah, that was pretty sharp. Kelly's got to be loving that one. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Craig makes like the best stickers, dude. Like legitimately, I've I've. <laughs> did you ever see the one of Kelly like, <laughs> as like Jesus like praying? I did. I saw that one too. The flowing locks. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's on my wall. Dude. That's right a goodie. There. That's a goodie. Yeah. Dressed in the robe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's the icon of the fly church. Somebody oh, called he him. Is. The, and you know, yeah. he was back here. He was big on the streamers back here. And I mean, he was, you know, he had the troutsman up there in TC. He was always kind of the, uh, he was a big foundation for a lot of the meat chuckers that uh, kind of got their feet wet into the game around here. So it was. Uh, so you, you worked for Kelly for a little bit, didn't you? No, no, I never worked for Kelly. I worked okay. with Kelly uh, doing some okay. you know, miscellaneous steelhead and salmon group trip type stuff. Nice. OK. Um, but no, uh, Russ, Russ Madden and him were pretty tight up there in the Traverse City area. I was south there about an hour and a half in Baldwin. I didn't I didn't get up to TC as much. Do you still do you still live and guide kind of out of the Baldwin area? I do. Yeah, I've I've got maybe a handful of rivers that I I kind of frequent. Um, and it's you know it's it's Western Michigan, and you know you know there's more people here snagging in the spring and fall than there ever gave a damn about a trout, which works out <laughs> great for me. You know what I mean? So, um, but, but yeah, it's uh, it is what it is. You know, Michigan's got. Uh, Michigan's got some, uh, you know, uh, little secrets there as far as the salmon and the steelhead are concerned. And it's an awful shame, too, because we got a lot of wild fisheries going on here and we're kind of, uh, you know, sticking a fork in the pedal there, so to speak. So, um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're growing slowly. But, yeah, the trout fishing around here is not nearly as busy as a lot of the western fronts. Um, though I would say we can't boast six or 8,000 trout per mile below some tailwater in every, you know, hour and a half to two hours in any direction, but we do have some really cool, um, you know, between the night venues, 
the, the we, I mean, we have a fantastically long streamer fishing because we don't, we don't get that kind of winter that'll, I, though, you know, give it a week here because I've had an extra month of steelhead uh, two hand uh, swing guiding that usually we don't have. Usually by the middle of December, we're shut down and I start tying flies and barking at the moon and begging for the trout opener. <laughs> but you know, this year we got a clean month and a half extra of guiding. And I will say a week ago when I was finishing up, I mean, I, I mean, talk about, you know, that moment in, in Rocky four, when he's got the bloody towel, when Creed's about to fall and he says, don't throw it. And he threw the towel anyways. Yeah. That's, I was that, you know, that's a 10 month season we had here in Michigan. So yeah, I'm kind of glad that's, uh, I mean, it was a good season. I'm not bitching. I'm just saying it was a long, yeah. Yeah. No shit, dude. That's a lot of trips, man. Were there like any incredibly notable, you know, like experiences or fish this season? Oh, wow. I've probably, I've got, well, off the top of my head, I can think of three. Well, the third thing's kind of, you know, there's some lake enhanced brown trout in a couple of the ponds as it were not lake michigan per se not like a sea brown or a wisconsin brown but some of these lake enhanced browns that were able to kind of tiptoe i got another 30 inch which is you know kind of old news um but i did have a client with stream trout get two over two foot in one night that Holy never shit. happens that's you know and he didn't break it by much he had the first one by a quarter inch and he had the other one by a half an inch and I Damn, thought that was pretty cool that he did that. Um, and I did have one day this year. It was late September, just before the trout closing, that I was able to catch uh, a brown trout, a brook trout, and a steelhead all on the surface, all in a day. So that was cool. I've never done that before either. So a brook, a brown, and a steelhead all in a day on the surface. That was kind of cool. It took me about 14 hours other than trout bender. My wife let me go do a salmon snagging season here in Michigan. So I don't want to go near my local river because it's just full of jack pine savages trying to stab fish with big out hooks. And, and so I'm off in these trout creeks where you couldn't find, you know, a mammal save, you know, whatever raccoon or muskrat might crawl up behind you. And it's, and it, and it's just, there's nobody up there fishing and the, and the trout fishing is just fantastic. Again, Michigan is, uh, is not known for, uh, seven, 8,000 trout per mile, but we've got some great crick fishing. We've got a lot of good, you know, mediocre tailwater fishing. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's a full season by now. <laughs> you know, you finish that off with like four months of steel and you want to shoot somebody. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so oh, dude, I, I couldn't imagine I can't grasp like how big a brown that would be 30 inches. Like I've, I've held big fish, like big long fish, you know, but a brown, I couldn't imagine what that is in the hands, like a 30 inch brown. <laughs> well, you know, and I will say, you know, I, I you know, in the past I've been no, notorious. I love the hero, you know, and I fish alone as I get older, you know, I just, you know, when I work, I work. And when I'm fishing, I, I you know, if I got to go streamer fishing, I'm fishing with, you know, I can count on one hand, how many guys I would even consider rowing these days. I just assume go fish on, on foot somewhere. You want to go outside? Is that what's up? You want to speak? <laughs> Show them you can talk. Show them you can talk. Come on. Oh, oh. Okay, outside. So Tommy will uh, let the dog out so that he can go potty and uh, chase squirrels, which is always a uh, favorite pastime. Oh, it's no, all good. good. Yeah, you're it's good. either that or just get sacked by the hundred pound husky for a half an hour while he just keeps drilling it. I want to go outside. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. Where were we? 30, 30 inch browns. So it, it makes eight wakes creeks, you know, like some of the rivers that we're trying to catch some of these fish in are not, they're just, they're not that big. You know, if you're lucky enough to come across a tailwater like stream 30, then, you know, you've got some area to play in, but some of these areas that, you know, have these like little creeks or small rivers or, or even tribs that are attached to these cold water lakes that have, you know, you know, 
smallmouth and whatever else, pike, musk, you name it. They're all kind of running around in these bigger, deeper lakes. But when they come up, they have that same kind of brute that you would find on a C. for Ellen Brown, which are a lot of those giants that are, you know, maybe only five, six years old, but can exceed 30 pounds in Wisconsin warm water. We used to get the plants here in Michigan to the C. for Ellen when I was younger. And, you know, some of those browns would exceed 15, 20 pounds, and you'd hear of a couple of 25 pounders caught from, in fact, uh, Tim Roller, uh, an older friend of mine that got that uh, world record at one point just north here on the Manistee throwing crankbaits for kings. That's a sea for Ellen. That was over 40 pounds. And as Holy big as shit. that fish is, you know, it's still only five, six years old. When you're talking about these, you know, uh, river residents, you know, these fish age real slow. Like they might get to 20 inches inside of four or five years. But beyond that, it's a slow progression. And they don't all go the, the distance. You know what I mean? Most of them die around. 20, 22 inches. A few of them go the distance and they get a routine with those log jams. That's how they get big is those log jams. They use them as, as kind of a foundation of routine and a feeding kind of, you know what I mean? So yeah. if you move the log jams, I've always said that the brown trout are most vulnerable. The really big ones, like if you have a river that has log jams where they're allowed to be hidden for the other 90% of the year, when you shift the log jam or a high water comes in and knocks it out of there, for the next year or so, you've busted up his routine and he's falling behind in the calories. And you can often get him. You can often get him because he's he's off his he's off his routine and he can fuck up. And if so, he fucks up, you win. So. <laughs> so all these log jams like these trout condos. So um is that why I know this is almost kind of like a loaded question, and I, I know partially some of some of the answer for this but when it's real high water i know what it's there has to do things to do with water clarity and you know the barrow and all kinds of other things um but is that why when we see a lot of displaced timber should we be fishing when we see displaced timber or <clears throat> i would say just yeah so like let's say that you move one log jam and that log jam breaks up and then makes a new log jam right eventually that new log jam is going to, somebody's going to take residence and, and dominion over that, that area. You know what I mean? The bigger yeah. trout, you know, those are the, you know, in our river in the Pier Marquette, anything over 23, 24 inches starts to get to call the ball, so to speak. He can like own the bed. So he can move around in there and, you know, the 18s, the 16s, they're going to feel pretty comfortable, but any underclassmen for there are vulnerable and fair game at the drop of a hat if he's just feeling like he's for so, you know, it, it's kind of in that respect of wood, if you change his routine, then he's going to like have to expose himself. He's going to have to do something different to retain his size. Because again, once they get to a certain size, if their routine falls apart, which works for them, which allows them to keep that weight and keep that growth over as many years. I mean, some of these fish are old enough to vote and <laughs> and I will tell you, I mean, if you break up that routine, they can, they can be vulnerable. They're, they're, um, they're in a place that they haven't been in the age of the log team, I guess you could say. Tommy, dude, so I guess to backtrack some, for people that don't know who you are, <laughs> who, who are you? What do you do, man? Oh, I, I just... I've, I've pretty much thrown my whole life away on fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I never really, I, I never really uh, branch out. I used to do some bow hunt when I was a kid. I used to spin fish when I was really young. Um, I tried bowling that didn't take. Uh, yeah, that's, that about sums it up. I have two beautiful boys and a wife that's way out of my price range, but um, you know, here's hope. You know, that's, that's, that's about this. Yeah. That's about it. That's about it. Fish nice. and, and family. <laughs> Fish and family. That's about it. And a big dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you've been guiding, um, like 20 something years now, right? Uh, 32 years. Holy shit, dude. Yeah. 32. Holy shit. <laughs> I don't, you've, you've really got to love fishing to do that for that long. No, no, you don't. You just got to have a, a severe screw loose is all you, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta be able to find, 
something fresh, interesting, exciting, all while doing the same fucking thing over and over and over again. But it, you know what? And, and, you know, when you're young, you hear shit like this that you, you don't really appreciate it until you've looked at it enough. But it, it's, it's true to say that I have never, as I get uh, more seasoned, I don't know if I've ever seen the same river ever. I've gone down the same sections, but every time you go, there's some happenstance, some circumstance, some water condition, whatever. There's something that makes it different, and then there's data to draw from that day. And, uh, and I don't know about you, I just get off on watching those big butterballs come out and take a swing. So if you think and hope, you don't have to necessarily cast to be in the, the game with it. You know what I mean? You can, you know, if, if you think for a second, I'm not staring at the guy's fly for 90, you know, I've crashed into trees staring at the damn guy's fly. Oh, <laughs> shit. I'm sorry. I was looking at your shit. You know, and, and it, you know, and you see it moving through the water and it's all, you know, drunk and, move, you know, and everything's right. And then, uh, yeah, no, that doesn't get boring. You know, that's kind of like looking at the Victoria's Secrets catalog. I mean, it's there. You're going to look at it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm thinking about just looking at the fly and, and going down the river and, and, it, you know, we float fish a lot in the West, you know, and, and, uh, for steelhead and salmon and everything else. So, uh, you'll, you'll get into that trance where, you know, you're, you're, you get into a really good run and you're just back rowing in the drift boat and you're watching and watching all of a sudden you look up and here's a sweeper right in front of you. You're like, shit. And then you got to the like, fuck? Kick, yeah, you got to <laughs> kick sideways. And then there's a fucking root wad off to the left and you're like, shit, you know? And so you're like starting to do this top turn and, your buddies are in there. You're like, just keep the fucking gear in the water. Just get your rod tip up and move it. You know, I was like, there's who said you something. can talk, keep fishing. I'll deal yeah. with it. Yeah. They're like, Oh shit. I'm like, shut up. Just shut up. I'm going to fucking control this boat. And so I'm like, uh, I'm like, you know, trying to dodge around. I totally get that because that's like one of those things where it's like, you know, you're just waiting for that thing to go funk right underwater. And then, and then you're kicking the anchor and you're like fish on, you know, and then, and then it all hell breaks loose in the boat, you know, then you got a net trying to come out and everybody reeling up and all that. So no, totally, totally get that. Uh, but you know, I've always been fascinated by, by the, uh, anadromous fish species of the, the great lakes. And, uh, you know, just because they came from where I'm at here in the Northwest, you know, you guys got them from up here and, uh, you know, the, the fishing methods and everything else, like I, you know, you talk to Herb about, you know, some of the, the fishing methods up in his area. Uh, I won't repeat what he said, but you know, he's just like, yeah, you know, it's not necessarily what, what you think it is, you know? Oh, you mean I, the entire spring falsehood of steelhead here? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly where he's coming from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I won't elaborate any further with that, but uh, basically it, when, when you said that they allow salmon snagging, I know they do that in Alaska. They don't do it here, like okay, in the so, Northwest. So is there just that many fish coming out of the Great Lakes that you can just go out there and barrel, you know, eight, 10 odd, you know, treble hooks and, you know, 18 ounce weights and just oh, go jerk? Oh, no, jerk? no. They make it look so much prettier here. Now you should know that I, I am not clean of it. Okay. So I have done the Let's see here. I was young, dumb, and needed, you know what I mean? You want to be a fishing guy, that's where you got your foot in the door. Back then, nowadays, the playing field between smallmouth, musky, and everything, I mean, there's no reason a guide has to do that. But, you know, back then, it was hexes and basically the sagging and salmon skillet. But I, I make no mistake that the runs, the Pure Market gets no plants of steelhead, none. Like, it is a all-wild fishery. And and the fact that we allow still to this day, I haven't taken one of those trips in about 15 years. And still to this day, ooh, are you guys okay? You guys can come in. Did you get donuts? Yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you got Wesco donuts. Yeah. <laughs> Kids okay, got donuts. Here we go. So we're doing a podcast. I shouldn't be talking to you. Uh, okay. that's okay no that's um, fine you can have the whole family join oh god it. you tell a fat irishman there's wesco donuts oh that's yeah you want to see <laughs> he moves quickly <laughs> like a brown trout to a good streamer you know <laughs> um 
So uh, you should know that Michigan has a bad, bad problem. And there's not a lot of people on the west side of Michigan that, number one, like me because I, I'm one of the very, I mean, I'm going to say I'm in like the, the club of about two or three guys on the west side of Michigan that no longer take money to go out there and show people a chuck and duck. Have you heard of this? No. Elaborate. Okay, chuck and duck is basically they'll go out and they'll dress up like fly guys. Sim, Sage. Thomas and Thomas, Orvis this, Orvis that. They'll dress up in all this fly fishing gear. And then on the fly rod, they'll put colored, am- you know what amnesia is? Yeah. Yeah. Colored yeah. monofilament. They'll rig that as the fly rod. And then they basically run a false leader right below it to put three number two shot. You know what a number two yep. shot looks like? Mm-hmm. About the size That's of a pea. Yeah. yeah. They'll put three of them on to fish a foot and a half of water that moves nothing like your West coast rivers. Right. It's much slower. And y- if you're asking how many steelhead are procreating in our river, you would shit yourself. And if the West coast guys knew what we were doing to our wild fish, they'd come over here and probably shoot us all just to stump out the gene. You know what I mean? <laughs> because I- no, I'm not even kidding you. It's well, so sad. I can't even approach my rivers. There's so many people doing it. And they're not they're not trying to get a bite. They're just out there playing glorified mouth hockey, uh, uh, lining, snagging, bump. You can call it a bunch of stuff, but it is what it is. So uh, I guess what we would call that here is flossing. That's yeah, what well, we would yeah, call that. Mouth hockey, flossing, same thing. Yeah. But no, here yeah. they don't even floss. There's some, there's some uh, hook sets that are without merit i guess the the drift down and then the big jerk at the end with the big bow and the line whipping through and maybe a little wad of yarn on the end of it that's about right we call it the manistee twitch here it's like some kind of (laughs) Uh, we call it the kenai twist (laughs) because that so uh you know so we'll go back to the whole you know, wild, the wild steelhead thing, right? Because no, wild rainbows, I should say wild rainbows. Well, I, should, well, I, I, I won't insult you and say that. No, you should, because I've been to the North Umpqua. I know what a steelhead from the ocean and what a steelhead from the lake is. Yeah. And my buddy's crazy. going down there. Uh, well, he's going main stem Umpqua on Saturday. So, oh, uh, nice. yeah. yeah. So uh, there, there's some absolute monster steelhead, unbelievably big steelhead wild too. And they will, they will kick your ass in that river. They are. It's a big piece of river too. They get some current to their advantage in there. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they, when they dog you in the middle of a tail out, like, you know, people in Michigan listen to this and it's like, oh, a tail out. Really? It's like, oh, let's crank it up to 6,000 CFS. That's good fishable water, by the way. Let's crank that up because the river's, you know, a half mile wide. Mm-hmm. so yeah we got we got some jurassic rivers around here those are those are different rivers and i tell you what wading and hiking up and down those big boulders just about killed my ass so yeah, yeah. that's that's a that's a normal day uh i guess but um so you have enough steelhead to floss our beds are so there's this place called Waddell's. We call it the Hilton of the Andromeda. But you know, the the Kings. There'll be, let's say, there's 2,500 spawning over a. Mind you, the river is 40 or 50 yards across in this spot. Okay. Tiny. Um. Sometimes it pinches to about 20. Okay. But in this 20 or this 250 yard little straightaway, there's probably 4,000 Kings spawning, and upwards of 1,500. I don't know about 1500 there'd be about 750 steelhead though that will potentially spawn in that same area wow that's a that's a pretty dense red that's a dense red oh no no it's it's 250 yards of gravel yeah free stone gravel like the whole thing is it's not just one red it's you'll see one female she has four males with her and you'll see let's say Let's say there's 50 af- active beds over that 250 yard area. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So yeah, I I guess I'll step back to the 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 wild steelhead thing. So I don't know if people on the West Coast would necessarily get upset at Great Lakes steelhead that are you know naturally reproducing in Great Lakes tributaries because they were never. It's not like our steelhead where they've it's been natural. here. Yeah, where yeah, where they have been native here versus since, wild, native yeah. versus wild. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, 
we have uh, uh, in a lot of our uh, higher basins, there was a lot of planting of coho done. Uh, and, and, and that was done for a multitude of different reasons, sport fishing, commercial fishing, uh, supporting marine mammals, you know, the, and, and so they stopped doing that because they're like, these fish shouldn't be in this area. Technically, technically you shouldn't have coho going over big falls in, in the fall, because that's when they run here. They, they could, they couldn't go over something that's 120 feet vertical. Right. So, right. so yeah, you know, they, they couldn't make it. And so they weren't native in certain river systems. So they actually allow for what you would call wild retention in these areas. But, but the notion of, uh, you know, I mean, just, just the, the notion of flossing it's okay in Alaska, you know, with sockeye and stuff with like that. Sock, sockeye, I did yeah. that. I got it. Yeah, they're they're plankton too. eaters. I mean, we get them on the Columbia on spinning globes. Oh, they're and, so and, tasty. Oh, oh God, they're, they're, so they're well, coho is too. Oh. I mean, the, you can't beat it. And oh, the, the coho is good too, but that sockeye. Yeah. I mean, oh, that the 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 spring chinook we get here. You guys call them kings. We call them I, chinook. Yeah, springers. Yep, yep. Springers are at the top of the list of those anadromous species, and a summer steelhead here. Is right up there because they have such a long wait in the river. But I don't know if anybody would necessarily get upset if they were out there flossing them. I, I think I think if it was like, oh, here's this ancient strain that was on, you know, the Olympic Peninsula and you had, you know, some of your guys from Western Michigan show up, start doing that. Yeah, they might not leave the big woods. You know, they might not leave right, the OP. Right. They might. They might just end up, you know, kind of predatored out out there, and somebody say, "Well, Bigfoot did it." But could we could we afford the same notion if we said that if you were out in Montana fishing up below there, and we were snagging anything but the kokanee salmon below the land of giants, that mm -hmm. you wouldn't be a little bit shunned away too? Yeah, that's so, that's. Yeah. So the argument isn't so much the native over the wild, so much as is it a wild reproducing fish, which in this day and age, and all the failing fisheries that we have. Mm -hmm anything wild should be somewhat you know coddled a little bit right if, if you have a healthy enough uh river ecosystem where it hasn't been you know so overdeveloped that you know it can support that level of of fish that's a good thing i think what also helps is is that they're they aren't the legacy species of the midwest that's the that's one of the other things is your legacy species of the midwest especially the northern midwest are Mackinac, you know, lake trout, uh, musky, pike, but you know, brook trout, walleye, yep, you're right. yeah, brook trout, brown trout. Those, those are really those legacy species. And these ones are kind of like, well, you know, that's one of those things. I mean, we screwed up in Oregon with our chum salmon. We had two rivers that, and they still get a massive amount of fish coming back. But you, you, you had, when I was a kid, people would go out there with a fly rod with 20 pound test, you know, like eight, eight, nine feet of 20 pound test with a piece of yarn and a split shot on it, just like they're doing a steelhead and they go swing it through. Difference with a chum is, is that, that, uh, you can run a yarn, what we call a yarny out here. You can run that and, and they will fly across the run and hit it because the chums really ate everything, don't they? Yeah, Those yeah. dogs. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. They really do, man. You could throw them anything. Charisse in Alaska was our role, man. Just... Yeah. Uh, Charisse, uh, uh, chartreuse here. It's chartreuse. chartreuse. That's yeah. big. Okay. Gotcha. Very yeah, good. Anything Thanks. chartreuse. They just annihilate. That's, we did that's good kind on of the, the silvers in Alaska on the chartreuse. We should, I didn't try that on the chums as much, but hot, I, yeah. hot pink and orange here on the, on the silvers that those mm -hmm. are the two, except when they get into the tribs and then it's jet black. I don't know what you know, it is. What's weird too is when they get in our tribs, They'll take surface flies and everything, even when they're on the beds, but they like yeah. the chartreuse. Yeah. Oh, uh, and maybe it has something to do with watercolor. I've noticed that. Big it's time turbidity time. based. It's yeah. turbidity and, and uh, uh, chlorophyll and all that stuff. It, it depends on the river. Some rivers, you can throw something orange and white. It looks like a creamsicle. Bang. You're just blowing them out left and right. The next river down, all black. The next one, chartreuse head with the black, you know, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. hairball leeches and stuff like that twitched, you know, uh, those types of things that, that where, you know, or, or dirty hose intruders, uh, you know, pick, pick whatever big tube fly pattern. And let's Anything not forget, they'll come up and hit a bobber too. So yeah, I've, I, I've had them wind <laughs> that around would be and fucking sick, dude. I, yeah. you know, uh, in Alaska, everything happens in Alaska. They, they, they'll throw top water plugs for bass for those fish and they come up and whoop like that. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. No, the silvers, we got a bunch on the surface up there. 
Uh, the silvers here in Michigan, wherever you find them in the fall, you can get them to hit the surface. We've only gotten four fall fish to go here steelhead wise on the surface. But in the summer months, when we're mousing for the browns, we, we'll, get, we'll get probably seven or eight of those summer steelhead hooked up, and we only land a small percentage of that on a single hander in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they kind of take you for a ride. Yeah, around the next two bends before I've got my hand on the anchor rope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, doing all that guiding and stuff, I mean – uh what's been your experience with these trout and steelhead and salmon and all that kind of stuff i mean do you have a lot of people hitting you up like i want to go catch a salmon or a steelhead or a trout or i mean well, or or more people interested in just pursuing the trout well I, I i won't i won't tell you that i haven't kind of pushed myself into that buttery corner just because and that's by preference but i will tell you that i really push my clients real hard to show up for that fall steelhead just because I've always said that a, a fall steel on AK Lake bow, Michigan style, whatever, mm -hmm. um, is just a very, very client friendly fish. Here's a, here's a technique with a two handed, um, uh, rod that requires almost no perfect cast and very little in the presentation world, as far as the do's and don'ts of rod movement and line speeds where a swung fly becomes the correct presentation and they're still allowed to button up on 10 plus pound trout that you know bust their knuckles into cheese graters i mean it's yeah no that 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 gets a good i mean like if the knuckles bloody i get a bigger tip so yeah. <laughs> that's good that's good i i, I I have to say that, that your steelhead do put up good fights from what i can see i also see a lot of really light tackle used as well Oh, I'm using goat rope. I'm using 20 pound. I use Good. 20 pounds of my swing fly on eight weight rods. And there are fish in the lower river that are seven pounds. It'll show you the backing knot three times. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, as far as them zip, you'll bring a seven pounder to the boat like three times. Yeah, I'll run on you. Yeah. And it just, and, and it, you know, like I said, I, I will notice that, you know, when you when we have a steelhead in the ocean, it's not, it's not the top of the food chain. So it's got to be a better, meaner, stronger version of its Lake Michigan self. Um, and, and if everybody wants to call them big bows, I'm just, I'm happy with that. Cause that gets us in that kind of Jurassic Lake world of gigantic rainbow trout. And so it matters really nothing to me. All I care about is the guy in the front seat that turns around with that shit eating grin on his face. Everybody <laughs> watches that fish cover a bender ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I'm so happy you guys have that good of a fishery because around here it, it's just you know the salmon and steelhead numbers they're, they're they're all over the place ocean conditions really do play a big key factor I heard about the warm blob this incredible spay fisherman that was our guy tony cummings a really great friend and client of mine took me out there a couple of summers ago just before they closed it you know because mm -hmm. they had the forest fire and the heat and all that other shit and uh i got to fish give me just one second he was so rich uh, Zellman, Rich Zellman. This guy was like, he had the sweetest cat handed snap tee I think I've ever seen. I mean, it was clean and door stopped each and every. And it was just a pleasure to see a guy in his element just that deep into the spay world. Cause I, you know, I dabble four months a year and it, this guy's given his, you know, throwing the whole quarter at it. So um, yeah, it was uh, quite an experience. I got to hook up two on the dry fly. That was awesome. And uh yeah, I will not soon forget that one. But yeah, to say that, you know, th those fish are the same fish, you could say maybe biologically, but again, if it's not the top of the food chain, it has to aspire to be more than it is. Whereas in Lake Michigan, they hit the top of the food chain the moment they're six pounds, you know? So just a different animal here. Yeah. Tommy, so even with all this, all this, you know, experience, uh, fishing all these different species, what draws you back to these buttery browns, dude? Oh, well, let's, let's, let's break down fly fishing and why we do it, but I'll give you a fair answer on that. And that is, um, you know, we all do this, this absolutely the hardest, most infuriating, least productive way known as fly fish. We throw chicken and try and sell it as meat. And, and it's, <laughs> and, and it just, it, it, we're, we're asking a lot because we cater to one sense when we cast a fly. It's only one, it's the visual. 
We don't get to smell like a fish. We don't taste or feel like a fish. So it's as much, uh, you know, trying to add the sport because it's not just what you're throwing. It's how you're throwing it, where you're throwing it, when you're throwing it. And if that's all the case, if it is just about the sport, because if it was about catching fish, we just all get the crawlers and the spinning outfits and get her fucked on. But if it's about the sport, the brown trout and the think, the variables of time of day, knowing the hunter's window, kind of identifying why he's out and why you should stay home and tie flies that day instead. It's, a, it's almost like a, a little bit more personal cat and mouse game and it adds a shit ton more sport. It's a rabbit hole. I think that brown trout is just a, a deeper, meaner rabbit hole with so many techniques in which to engage them or consider. And, uh, you know, you're not just throwing streamers. You're, you're out there in the middle of the night trying to come up with answers at dawn with a rodent. You know, you're trying to go out there with salmon caviar and sneak up on them on like eggshells because the water's gin clear. You throw them a hopper six times because you know it lives under that bank. And it was on the seventh cast that he came out and looked. Why was it seven? That's, that's what fucks with me. That's what keeps me from falling asleep, to be honest, doggone it. It's, 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 it's a neat rabbit hole. And, you know, this, like I said, the steelhead pull harder. They fight harder. Muskies are long and beautiful and, and, and that dart they make on that. But, but the think, the think that I need to imply to get those larger browns in a watershed where I know that they are at, that adds a level of sport that I have not found in any other fish yet. Not even those Alaskan rainbows. Those things jump and pull line off a real like wild, you know? So, yeah, sorry. No, no, dude, you're, you're good. Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I think that's fucking fantastic sick. summary. I, I mean, that, <laughs> that really does summarize. It's like there's a hunt, there's a game, there's a puzzle. You know, if you like, if you like puzzles, fishing's a great puzzle. It is. It is. It is a great, it's a, it's a, <laughs> dark deep rabbit hole with witchcraft and speculation as your only real <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is very true I, I, you know you, you go weeks without catching something and then all of a sudden everything just lights off on fire and you're like why why well, that's that? that could be barometer that's that's a barrow that, yeah yeah that's a barrow yeah yeah they, they, i don't they, live and die on those moons i i am not a moon guy I, but that barrel, I've been wearing one of those old barrel watches for, I had a Casio Pathfinder for like 15 years. And now I've got this, she had to sell me on the iWatch because it had the barrel. I wasn't going to get it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, the barometric, I can't tell you when it's coming or, or, or even why it's coming, but I can show you why it's there. And it's that low flat. I mean, I will say 95 to 97% of the days were out of 100 that I see a good bite window. That is to say where I'm in a fishery that I frequent it enough to say that, fuck, it's on. You know what I mean? It's, we're, we're, we're in it. And, and if you can identify that moment, because, you know, one, one man's incredible window is, is, is another man's, you know, slow. You go to the White River in Arkansas, and if you don't have four fish in hand in the middle of the night, that are over 20 by midnight, it's time to go find some hot dogs or some cold pizza, you know? And, and, you know, whereas here in Michigan, that's, that, that would keep your head above water plenty fine. So it, it's, 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 it's a little different. And I forgot the question. I just backtracked. I was looking at a client, sorry, nothing. Uh, what was that question again? <laughs> dude, I don't even remember, but that's okay. Um, All right. I, I rambled. Oh, dude, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I get lost in it though. Uh, we were talking, well, we were talking about Barrow and then you mentioned the, the, the stable low. Is that, so do you think that's when the window is kind of there? Yeah. So, you, you know, the, the best look I've had at it because brown trout are finicky, critiquing, moody pricks. And the amount of time that it takes to kind of draw data from an overall um, lifetime of having them take suicide hits, which is to say that the streamer, mouse, you know, whatever, hits the water and within three seconds of a bender, you're on. I call that the suicide hit. Whereas everything after that is a sold response, as I say, or at least the happenstance of your streamer or mouse coming into his proximity. 
So everything else is sold, whereas everything else is kind of the suicide or it's just flat out ignored. It's like I've always said, like everybody thinks, oh, you're doing so good. You know, we got like six or seven fish out of a section of river that had 6,000, which is to say that the other 5,900, you know, that they all said no. So whenever we think we're doing good, we should take into consideration how many fish are saying no as much as yes. So, um, you know, that barrel thing, going back to the barrel thing, when you see that low flat come in and the steelhead, like I said, being a little bit more, or I should say lake bows, I apologize. I do. <laughs> um, the steelhead, you know, the snow squalls we get off Lake Michigan, right? We have a lake effect machine, which basically every time the air gets cold and the wind blows west, we'll just get punched with like six inches of snow over like two, three hours. You know what I mean? So it could be completely blue and getting cold up until that squall forms, in which case you have a high barometric set. And then as that storm builds, you'll see the pressure start to drop. As that pressure drops and the, stoke, the, the, the storm is relevant and close, you'll see a flat. Now, Fishing, what I call the V, sucks. Like if it goes down and goes straight back up, you're going to see a bite window that's five minutes long if you're lucky. But if you can get it to drop and then flatten, that's the fish identifying that there's a storm coming. And they feel that in their swim. I had to hear this from a biologist to actually take this into consideration. But their swim bladders, to keep their equilibriums from keeping them, you know, tipping over and shit, is so sensitive. So sensitive. And that air pressure is felt. And when they feel that storm coming, they know that there's a, there's a hurt. You know, it's like deer. Before the storm, you see them feed like crazy. As soon as that storm hits, they're all up bedded up under some cedar and they're waiting it out. And fish aren't any different. They're gathering those acorns just before the storm because they know that the water is going to rise with the storm that brings moisture. And if they're going to be burning calories, they better stack up some extra. So it's just like that squirrel putting away the acorns in the tree. It's kind of looking forward to what could be a certain amount of water. So typically the lower the barometric pressure is when it does that flatten, the better off you are because they can feel that intensity of that storm. On the same end of that scale, I would say that, you know how like some days you could say that the bite is on, but it's not off the hook, right? Yeah. Those days when you would swear that a bare hook would work, why is it all working? And everybody, you know, of all the fishermen that you talk to, conventional, fly, doesn't really matter. There's one remaining constant with them all as far as what works. And that in and amongst the group of ego freaking weirdos that all think what they're doing is the only way and it's the only way that's right, which is hilarious. <laughs> uh, they all agree on one thing. And that is, do you remember that day we were fishing in front of the thunderstorm? You guys all remember that day? We've never talked about this day, but I know you've had one. And that pre-thunderstorm bite is that barometric flattening. And that flattening occurring a second time, which is to say it drops, flattens, and then does it again, that second drop is when that bear hook works. That's when the fish know it's a big storm. It's a mean storm. I got to feed now. And uh, yeah, you'll see that. Now, don't get me wrong. You can have bite open up based upon like a forage, like salmon fry, or even the post thunderstorm that gets the riverbanks bleeding with night crawlers and dead crawdads rolling down. You know, that's just a, a banquet for them. Mm -hmm. And that can key up a bite. Um, but as far as that sensual or that sense overload where you get that, you know, idea where there's not a whole lot of water temperature change here. There's not a whole lot of depth change. In fact, there's not even a whole lot of cloud change here but I've noticed that this bite is odd. And, and every time that I look back on that watch, guess what it was doing? Dropping. Low flat. Yeah, it wasn't the drop. I always used to think it was the drop of those steelhead because you could go through a section. Yep. Let's say, uh, late bow, sorry. Um, <laughs> you go through, say like a thousand yards of river and in the deep winter when those fish are wintering over from the fall, let's say, Five holes constitute 150 steelhead. And these are bigger sandy holes. This is a holding water. This isn't the ripple pocket stuff. This is mm -hmm. this is sand, 10 feet of water. You know, they're even layered. There's no, there's no gravel in it. 
in this area, right? So you go through this section of water, and you already know they're there because you ran a couple of guide trips that week and you, you know, peeked into a few of them and watched them scatter like bees when you went over with a boat. So you'd go through there and you'd say, man, I got two takes and there's got to be 150 curious, bored ass steelhead in those holes and none of them wanted it, right? So you look on the radar, you see the snow squall come. You walk right up to where you started. And you fish it again with a different barrel and you bounce 10 of them. So if that's not barrel, what is it? Yeah. There it is. I mean, you're, it's not like you changed your pattern. It's an egg. Steelhead are curious more than a brown trout's critique. Brown trout will come up and look at your egg and say, that's not quite enough orange in that orange cream clown egg, sir. I'm going to I'm gonna pass on this. <laughs> steelhead like, fuck, that looks like fun. Let's eat that, you know? Exactly. So steelhead are a little different, you know? That's why swing fly. Everybody wonders why we swing fly. What's the conventional knockoff? Just like, you know, spawn bags under a float is to our indicator slash bobber to a yarn fly, okay? Um, Rapellas and spinners, that's our streamer fishing, right? Mm -hmm. And swing fishing is simply our knockoff of drop backing plugs. Yep. All we're doing is dropping flash in front of, you know, 15 or 20 fish, you know, asking one to come out swinging like Tyson where the rest of them spook like, you know, and scatter like bees, so. Yeah. Difference. So when when you're talking about the drop, are you not the drop and then the the flat or the plateau out? Are we talking anything lower than two nine or nine two? Like so, if two nine or nine two is the standard, like in perfect world, that's your standard local sea level pressure is two nine or nine or two. So are we talking like two nine or eight five and below? Or are we talking like it's funny? You, it's great that you're bringing up numbers. Everybody that asked me this question never brings up the numbers and I'm glad you are. So for the longest time, remember how I always said that the, low, the, the meaner the storm, the lower the pressure gets. That's consistent with having a big low pressure or a thunderstorm or a snow squall, whatever the case in point. So the lower the pressure is likely the more intense the bite window, but there is a factor here. And this is something I've noticed after keep watching the watch under adverse conditions, looking for the windows to open when they shouldn't. And that is to say this, let's say we have high barometrics, like over 30 points for a few days. That means those fish have been in an off bite cycle for three days. Is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if I don't get all the way down to 29.80, but I get a drop in a mild flat, how many of those fish you reckon are going to go? Every fucking one of them. That's oh. right, because that shift occurred and they felt it and they wanted that bite, which is also to say that if you have high muddy water for three and a half days straight and you know they've been on the feeding bin for as many days, I give a fuck how good your barrow's sitting. If they've been eating for three days, they're going to be up under some log dam sitting on the couch, you know, watching TV and having nothing to do with it. They're done. So that cycle is always relevant to their last real gorge. So you'll notice like you ever, you guys ever fish streamer for the Browns in the deep summer when you get a thunderstorm and it's been like two months since you guys have had any really good colored rain and it chocolates up that river, right? The same yeah. reason we knock the cover off the ball in the dark is the same reason that window is so hot because you allowed that hunter the window. You gave him the dirty water to sneak up on shit. If he can sneak up on shit, he's coming out. So the conditions will set that tone as well as the barometric. The barometric will give them a sense under any condition that it's time to feed, whereas a conditional or food source will also set them off. So can you coax those fish off their couches? I mean, is that a thing? Or are they just- You guys just, have a much better chance at that than we do. Because you guys have a lot of open runs in the West and stuff, where even when he's not on a feeding lane, shallow killing shit, He's still nymphable in a presentable run. In Michigan, shit, this is, you know, our undercut banks are like Dr. Seuss's bad dream. You know, they crawl up under there. You're going to need a, a backhoe and, a, and some dynamite just to get a cast tool. We, we have that too. You know we what I'm, yeah, too. so you, yep. yeah, they're, they're gone. Clay they're bank gone. shelves, yeah, clay banks, uh, rock, rock shelves, but, you know, basalt. And, uh, you know, one of my friends, he ran a, a GoPro down a, a shelf in a very, it, it was a small river for us, right? He runs it down and they'd been throwing everything through this run all day long. And he runs the GoPro through there, pulls it up. There's about 30 steelheads sitting under the edge of that thing. 
won't come out, won't budge, won't bite nothing. And they're just hanging out there. Like I, you, good luck getting under the edge. I mean, unless you yeah. have, a, you know, a conventional wise, if you have a plug and you can get the right angle and you can run a plug yeah. down through there, that's kind of like throwing a grenade in their, in their uh. living room. <laughs> I mean, everybody's going to be like, what the fuck just happened? You know, <laughs> as a it's boom, a, you know, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, our, see most of our undercut does. I mean, we have this, we have some of that clay ledging and stuff where you'll come off four feet and go down to like 10 and stuff like that. Yeah. But most of the spots our brown trout use because our undercut banks is more like a, almost like more like a New Zealand type thing where instead of that graduation of shallow to deep to the center of the river, a lot of our depth occurs at the undercut where the undercut yep. goes underneath like grassy hardwood banks and you could bury a person under any part of that. And, and the creepy part is, is so I was an optimistic guy. I used to think our river was full of trout, right? And I guess I just wasn't optimistic enough because I went on one of these shocking crews. This is years ago in the mid nineties. And they were trying to get a, a count on the, on, they put that current up under that bank. I've never felt so inefficient as an angler. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just, I was fascinated by how well, not only the fish was using the undercut bank as pretty much trout condominiums, but how, like when they're at rest, you notice how like when predators are being predators, they don't like to share the same airspace with each other. You know what I mean? There's just something in the air that they don't want to be around each other while they do that. But when they are huddled up and trying to kind of uh, stay away from the, the light, the general public or any kind of canoe or boat traffic, you know, like I said, you couldn't, you couldn't find them. I don't know if you could find them with the GoPro because again, there's a, just the amount of root wad that we have coming out of our banks. It's <clears throat> nothing that you guys haven't seen. I'm sure it's just, it's, it's, yeah, we just, there's, when they're not out, they're not out. They can't be even presented to. So I'm right. Gotcha. No, no, you're good. That answer. No, that's good. Be. That's, that's, that's a lot of technical information, especially for people that are f fishing trout species, because right now, this time of year, January, those fish are going to be in those deep pockets. They're going to huddle up and you get your midge hatch or you get, you know, your nymphs and, and emergers and stuff like that, that are, that are down in that, in that zone, they get the right day to feed. They'll be feeding well, but other than that, it's pretty tough fishing. Yeah. That's there. A fact. That's a fact. No, no. It's winter always sets the tone for the winter. Whereas Lake Bow slash steelhead, you know, their, their Goldilocks is 45, the brown trout's 55. So, you know, Steelhead gets 35 degree temperatures. We still get them chasing. You know, we fish that strip fly a bunch here too. So we can get our steelhead to chase that thing in the dead of winter. They'll come all the way to the boat and just slam right into the boat. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we've had a few, like you can hear the heads of the fish. They're just, they don't know when to turn off as well as that brown trout does. But um, I've always thought that was weird. Cause you can noticeably see the brown trout bites start to slip under 38 degrees. And I, I don't think they'll steal. I give a damn. They just, you know, they're always looking for something fresh and dumb to do, you know? Yeah. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our steelhead are, um, they're, they're 45 is the happy medium, mm -hmm. 45 to 50, 50. They start getting real active. You get a clear day, anything with flash, they can come and crash into at, at, at hyperspeed. Uh, but a lot of it, it anymore has just really been, a lot more finesse presentations, you know, wow. uh, small light tackle, you know, I, I say light tackle, 10 pound test leader, 12 pound test leader, you know, fluorocarbon, uh, just because rainfall, turbidity, chlorophyll, um, discharge, everything else. It's really, uh, a lot of it has been, um, more and more finesse than it had in the past where, you go put a wad of salmon eggs on, you know, if you're a conventional person, you put a wad of salmon eggs on and just go drift it through a run with maybe like a, you know, a, a eight to, to, you know, four millimeter corky to float it. And it, it would get railed by a fish. Now it's like, you know, a quarter ounce, uh, uh, marabou jig and uh -huh. that gets railed. So it's, it's kind of strange, but it's like the, you know, the selectiveness of the fish has changed a lot, but beads anything circular 
that yeah. that's like the go-to no, bait. beads are taking over the midwest too i'm not and i'm not I, i'm so anybody that's getting a bite and i'm is okay and my, i could care less if he's getting it on a bead or grenade or if he's getting a bite he's getting a bite right so i i guess i guess what i would have to say about the bead guys just clean up a little i mean mm -hmm. so we that wood that we talk about in our rivers right so yeah and i'm not saying fly guys aren't breaking off some stuff but we break off a couple feet of tippet or maybe four and we have a hook in the water so when these and i'm not sure what they're doing wrong because if they're using six and eight pound test on these beads like i keep hearing they are i can't figure out how the fuck they keep breaking off these fucking 11 gram bobbers they're floating around on damn near every structure we have in this river and this is a new thing i mean we've had center pinning now for about i don't know six seven years maybe eight and it, and the amount the of and i'm not saying that the the the, the what do you call it the open faced guys aren't blowing up at the reel too but Man, that's a lot of shit in the water. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of that's a lot of dead birds. That's a lot of floating. That's just I don't know. I just think you know at some point some of the the conventional guys that are using those and let's face it, they can probably make some money at the rate I'm seeing bobbers getting broke off. I mean, those things are about twenty bucks a pop. Some of those nice pin bobbers, and yeah. they're breaking them off like gobstoppers on the bottom of the river. And I'm kind of saying, man, what are you doing for a you know, <laughs> I mean, shit, it's got to get expensive. I'll, I'll have to get some pictures of all the floats that you see around here that, that get broke off. Uh, one, one thing that happens is, is you get snagged up so bad that, you know, you'll, you'll, even with 12 or 15 or 20 pound test, it, 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 and that's what we run out here. We don't, we don't run a lot of six and eight pound test out here. It's, it's bigger, bigger line. But you get snagged up, and it, just the whole damn thing comes undone. It, it just yeah. all breaks off, you know. Yeah. Um, especially if you're ro rolling down river, and then all of a sudden, you know, you can't back up here. It's not like you can back. No, up and, that, and that's and that's I guess where my argument would be. It'd be one thing to be in these class one, class two rivers and not have the option, right? But yeah. we're talking about rivers that are moving with. I mean, the Pier Marquette when it's pumping is 700 cfs at the bottom. <laughs> you know so you know right it's, it's like it's, a creek <laughs> right now we have the big manistee in there they're still pumping three thousand and four thousand out of the big rivers. that's but better it's just i don't know i just i just think with the amount of people that are fishing today versus 20 years ago that if we don't start taking some steps and i'm not saying that gear regulations are the answer to everything but to some respects it does at least protect those sections of river where they might be able to make us some more you know and and this is where you know i've always kind of had a little bit of a bone to pick with with all of this hatchery you know it's like once the hatcheries get into a state it's like i hear a lot about hatcheries and i don't hear nearly enough about wild fish which and as far as i can tell in the trout slash steelhead world is becoming a rare bird so i i just can't you know i don't know i just i wish we had some more forward thinking because the rate of growth of this this fishing thing this popularity of the amount of people doing it in waters that are finite they have not changed those rivers they're not growing with the public they're still the same size and the runs aren't getting better they're getting maybe worse so I, I will say we had a really good run this year, but that's not to say that, you know, the next two or three might be in the shitter. And I'm just saying, if we protect it more with the amount of people that are fishing, that some of these regulator or special regulation waters that are afforded to these states should be thought a little bit more forward. I think, I think we should. And I also would like to also say that, you know, as stewards or at least representatives for the, the watersheds, guides are supposed to be setting a good example. We're yes. supposed to be doing it better, cleaner, stronger, uh, setting a new uh, pace of evolution in whatever the technique may or may not be. And, and what I fear uh, for, for at least West Michigan is that by the time we come full circle with as many people that are talking about, you know, this or that, that we still have guides that just assume not, not take their, they're wearing hoods. They put their hoods up now when they when they're fishing ground. Most of these are just out of college kids that are, you know, hand in the outfitter or lodge, you know, 40% to call themselves a guide. And I, I feel for their situation. 
But when I came up, you had to be really good at what you did or be in the way just long enough so that you were offered a position, whereas now it's, it's more, it's different. And there is no etiquette bar that is, has uh, kind of evolved with this next generation. It's very cutthroat for these kids. I feel for them. It's a, it's a bad place to be with as many guides that want to be guides now. I mean, no wonder I don't start up a guide school instead of a guide service. So it, it, I, just, I just really feel for this incoming generation of guides because um, they all have to find a sense of doing something better, more unique in a environment that is saturated with great ideas. I mean, the flies that have come out, the, the information available to the average angler today via this computer versus myself and a gazetteer and a tank of gas when I was coming. So <clears throat> we didn't have a pin to go to. Some old timer slipped up at a coffee shop and said something while I was still pissed drunk from the night before or something like that. It wasn't your buddy and three other guys heard from this one guy that sent me a pin to this great spot, which they all can show up to by simply putting the phone on the dash and following the green line. It's different now. Um, even the techniques for tying, the, the available knowledge, this podcast, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? People can yeah. derive so much information that was never afforded to us when we were younger. And, and for a guide or somebody to stand out as somebody that should or shouldn't be hired as one man you've got some really good fishy clients these days if you're not standing out there out in front of that then you you should probably get into plumbing or or painting or or, or go back to college because I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something right now the only thing that'll get you through it all because if you're working for lodges and outfitters that leaves really no room for the individual growth of the independent contractor, which to some level we all are. And, and whether you're working for a lodge out there, you know, you're still often paying your own insurances, you bought your own boat. And in those places that they're offering such things for the sign on as a, to be a guide, you have to ask yourself what kind of guide needed a boat to begin with. So there, there's, there are variables to this, this up and coming, but we should be setting a better example. And here in Michigan, we still have a whole bunch of guides that are taking people down the river, booking a Michigan fly fishing trip, are given colored monofilament with three monkey nuts and told to throw at the wild reproducing fish that are in a foot of water trying to procreate. And they, they, don't, wanna, they don't wanna really pump it up like, they did, you know, 20 years ago when it was kind of cool to do in Michigan. Now they have their hoods up. Now they don't want to be recognized by any would-be actual anglers that are floating down on their own steam and say, well, this, this is what this guy, I guess, actually does. So, you know, there's, there could be some reckoning. We, we're due for some of that in this industry, you know? And, yeah, I think and, so. And, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm talking. I'm I was going to say, and the, the, there's a lot of you know, the, the social media factor plays into that also, you know, huge. everyone, wants to, huge. yeah, it's huge, you know, um, it's, it's, it's just bizarre, man. And you're right. Like as stewards of the sport, we have to do better, but you know, and that, that brings you to a question like how, we can hold ourselves accountable, but how the fuck can we hold anyone else accountable? Like, what do we do? Do we, do we get the DNR involved? Do we say, Hey, can you send people to go watch maybe this stretch of river? Like, I've seen like two fucking game wardens the whole time I've lived in Texas, which hasn't been super long. It's been like two years. So I've seen, I've had one encounter a year and that's like actually seeing them and them checking my license. It's mm. like, you know, it's, I don't feel like there's an, as you know, I am completely for them, but I am also a huge, um, I also want things from them as well. You know, I, I, I like DNR existing. I think they have a huge pivotal role they in do. what we do in outdoors. They but do. I, I also expect them to do what's right for the fisheries. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I guess, in Michigan, our slippery slope right now, because we have put so much in, I mean, like all that Ohio, Erie, all that stuff, that's all little manistee strain wild fish. That's north of my house here, 10 minutes. And all of those fish are being, you know, outsourced to all these, you know, 
outgoing communities, but how do we hold those people accountable? This is, this is what I refer to as the scary part. You know, when I was coming up, you know, when a veteran said I was going to go through this section of river, um, as, as the underdog, I would simply look and say, well, you won't see me there then, because that was me basically paying him homage saying, I'm not going to be a fly in your ointment, yeah. you know? And that was where we would kind of pay it to the vet. We had that respect, that etiquette coming up. Uh, nowadays, it was like I was saying, this cutthroat um, business of you have basically 50 guys all pinting away and kind of snipping at each other's throats for the position of three of them. Yeah. So that filter is huge by comparison. And when I came up, it was six guys looking for those three positions. So, you know, how do we call them out? I don't know if there is, there's too many of them. There's, there's too many new kids on the scene to advise anything that they are, let's say, unaware of. They are, it's like, I used to try and call them out for like, hey, when you see a guide coming, you don't pull your anchor and try and stay in front of them. I had that conversation with three or four of them before I just gave up with the idea that they don't know any better. They don't know that pulling anchor on a senior or anybody is just bad form. So it's a scab that's, uh, fuck, I'm 50. I got 20 more seasons and I'm, I'll cash out of this shit. So as far as these kids and, and the respect or etiquette that I've seen from them, oh shit, I really, really feel for the, cause, you know, here's the creepy part. They'll be in the parking lot all giddy gaddy, you know, oh, I, you know, how you doing, you know? And then you're like, at some like gas station and you hear them tear into the same kid. You know, it's like they got, they got four or five faces for whoever they're talking to. And you know, when I came up, you get called out for that shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You get thrown under, you weren't allowed to get in the cool kids club if you were that kind of, nowadays it's different. Nowadays you can have guys that were shunned in every corner of this industry, you know, start making as many boats as, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's different. It's just different. And I got to get used to it. But here's, here's the consolation prize. You ready? <clears throat> Even though I may never have that respect, None of these kids will ever know how good the fishing was before the parade. They will never know how good that was when fish used to feed on hatches next to the chine of the boat because they didn't know any better. You know what I mean? Now yeah. these fish are buried in a log jam where you'd have to be Babe Winkleman with a jig rod to pull them out of there. <laughs> yeah. That's it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, sorry, I'm rambling. No, dude, no. It's a good, this is absolutely a good talk to have. We, we, we end up on conservation and food a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my gut would tell you that I'm always on food. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're coming, we're, we're, we're a little bit past hour and it's fine. You know, sorry yeah. about that boss. No, 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 no. Oh, it's no. okay. It, it's totally fine. Because I think that uh, what, what we've just talked about in the last 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes has been, probably some of the most important stuff that we can talk about. And, and that is, is that th this is just isn't a fishing problem. Uh, it, it's not just in the fishing community. It's, it's a, it, it's an interpersonal uh, communication failure. That's, that's what we really uh, are talking about. 30 years ago, you think about the, the old timers that you were fishing around, right? They, if you pulled, you know, something like one, one of these guys does, do you think that they would just sit there quietly oh, in the boat? No, you'd have slash tires when you got back. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now the laws have changed. That's, that's one thing. So let's say, Tommy, you pull up to the boat ramp after, you know, you get low hold about 25, 30 times. Right. And, and you pull up to the boat ramp and. Um, and, and we're not talking low hole and like going 400 yards down river and fishing. That's a totally different thing. We're talking about somebody pulling up. They, they have the, the, the stupid ass sunglasses and the flat bill and everything else. You know what I'm talking about? Right. And, and, and they just look at you and, and they're like, Oh, what hey, are you, you going to do? Bram? I got some clean bill there. Okay. <laughs> right there. <laughs> John does too. So, so you think about that, the, the, you know, one of these little douchebags pulls up and they anchor right next to you and they just look at you. They're like, what are you going to do? And yeah. It's like, oh, no. 
and, and, and there's a part of me that that old school part of me, it's like, I should get up on the bow of the boat. I should no. jump over into your boat and I should just whip your ass and throw you in the river. No, but you can't, you can't oh, yeah. because you end up in prison for doing that. You well, know, I mean, that, that and 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 here's so and and here's a couple of those. Now, number one, going back to the you know thirty years ago, if you saw somebody on the river, fuck, you'd go talk to them. You know why? Because you yeah. hadn't seen anybody in four days. Yeah, yeah you're like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, are you and, doing any good? That's the whole thing. Like, uh, that's why I like fishing with some of the the older guys is because it's like, Hey, how you doing? You know, we'll be floating down the river and here's a couple older guys. We're like, how you guys doing? Oh, fish and shit. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah, <laughs> join the club, bud. You know, you guys, wh where are they at? You know, it's like, I don't know. The, the hatcheries don't put enough goddamn fish in the river. Oh that's yeah. What no, they, you know, why the yeah, stringer's they, nice and wet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's all of that stuff, but that's the fun part of the conversation on the river. And then, and then it goes from that to politics to, you know, name, oh, you know, that pick. shit out the boat. You go to, yeah, you lose yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah. It's like, all right, dude, I'm going to head down river. Okay. We'll see you around the bend. But you know, that's, that doesn't happen anymore. Like I said, you get, you get a, like three or four weirdos in a boat. You know, they went on Craigslist, they bought a boat, they're beating the shit out of it. And they, they go fish right through bank anglers areas. They go low hole people all the time. And they just, run around like you know it's like oh okay. i got a drift boat or i got a sled right. and i'm just gonna be a how jackass. can you yell at somebody that so the naive guy now the yeah. guggen we'll call him. okay yeah the guggen yeah the guggen i have a long leash for them only because i was there once i know how you almost have to be there to know what you're doing wrong first okay mm -hmm. now what's worse than the guggen which i I have some leash. I mean, they got to screw up to get better. That's fair. What I don't have respect for is that guy that you first referred to is this new kid. The new kid that is fully aware that when he comes up and drops below you, that's the guy that dares you to say something for something he already knows is out of line. And then when you do call him out for it, it's fucking drama. Yeah, that's that's the new comeback. Uh, they sit anybody. over there with their rod in the water, flipping their, you know, doing oh, yeah. this. It, it, yeah, it's like yeah. the funky no. chicken in the boat. It's actually kind of funny to watch. <laughs> well, and they they call you the drama queen because you have the sense to say, "Listen, you you're doing this wrong. I'm going to give you the the sweet version, mm -hmm. and then I'll either ignore you for the rest of my career, or I'll let you come back and say that I fucked up." And let's face it, the latter isn't going to happen from these new kids. They're just no. that's. They, they just don't have a spoon big, big enough to swallow that kind of pride. And, uh, and let's face it, there's an entitlement they feel like that if, if the river's as busy as it's been, that nobody, and nobody does own the river. Nobody does. Nobody, it's, it's everybody's. But there is a, there, you know, we, we, we should start talking. We, we're never going to have that talk because none of those kids are showing up. So it matters not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just how it is, you know so yeah that's the thing you know i mean just yeah i i don't know how we're ever going to get to a point of accountability when when you have uh, a, a group of people multiple generations i'm not saying one multiple that were mm -hmm. raised without any uh any kind of um personal responsibility for any of the actions they had mm, i agree no no and and that's uh wow you know you're, you're so right and it's so spooky and i don't know which way the sport goes i really don't i mean at some point it will get saturated enough you know and and to credit one thing we were talking about how a guy kind of gets away from it all and kind of steps out i would say that if it were one thing it is not your ability to catch the fish or have even the clients catch the fish there's plenty of great fishermen out there there's even fewer good guides but what really gets it down is whether they feel like they're progressing as a fisherman or not. If they feel like they're learning every time they get in your boat, you don't have to catch fish anymore. That's where that word of mouth comes from. And now we are way over time. I can already tell. No, 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 oh, no, you're good. <laughs> no. But no, I would say, you know, in my, in my boat, I get so much word of mouth on guys that are coming back that say, I want to know how to do this better. I want to have a better perspective at the water. And if you can sell that, then you don't necessarily have to be the first boat in the water, nor do you have to catch the most or biggest fish. What you have to do is be a better guide and, and a, you know, a better instructor on the overall experience 
um, especially with fly fishing, because let's face it, you know, with fly fishing, it's not about the numbers. It's, it's about the, it's kind of the journey. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the betterment of the, the technique until that window opens and allows you that, that timeline to really have your way with it. Um, so as they improve and then they open up a few of those windows for themselves, I mean, I've got this one guy, Rob Kinkoff. I've been taking him for 20 years. He comes for like 25, 30 days a year. You know what I mean? I mean, That's you awesome. get four or five guys that are into it like that. You don't, you don't really. Um, yeah, I think if, if you want to be a good guy, you better figure out how to get the rebooking instead of the new booking. <laughs> yeah. that's probably that's the best way to put it because there's not going to be as many <laughs> yeah i i think uh you know there again uh great friend of mine i'm his client uh he he has his guide service uh I, i'm going on third trip with him and it, it, he just started last year and i'm going on a third paid trip with him but i've went on unpaid trips with him because he's like hey you want to hop in my boat and go do this sure, like, sure. sure yeah, yeah that's yeah. cool thank you you know uh -huh. i still kick him gas money i'm not i'm not one of these guys oh sure like, get him a oh, six hey. pack of beer to what, make it go down too <laughs> yeah well you know uh, the gas was the biggest thing you know he's got a, a 25 foot sled so it's like dude, oh, wow. I, yeah, yeah, dude yeah that that costs money to run a jet you know and i'm not gonna sit here and be like oh thanks for letting me use your rods and your gear and everything else without you know saying hey thanks for doing that but, oh, but cool. it, it's cool when you do get to build that relationship with the, those people, because that's, that's one of those things where it's like, you know what, that it's, it's, it becomes more than just fishing. It, you actually, you know, you get to, to have that genuine relationship with, it with like it's somebody. Fun. It becomes, it's fun. It's no longer, it's not as much work anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, it's just, it's cool, you know? And then, and then you kind of get the inside line on stuff. Like I get pictures texted to me of like five or six steelhead today that, that oh. were caught. And it's like, hmm, okay. Yeah. I haven't got any yet. So uh, good for you. Uh, I know you're a guide. You're out there seven days a week. So, you know, you, you can go out and grind it out. That's your job. Uh, you know, I, I send it over to my other buddies that fish and they're like, can we go follow him? I was like, yeah, we can go follow him, but he'll catch all the fish out from underneath our boat. So mm -hmm, maybe, maybe right, we want to go on the day that he's not there and, <laughs> and we go have our adventure, you know, that, that comes into a whole other thing. It's like, we know where the rivers are. It's about the adventure, not about like, you know, yeah, it's cool to catch fish. We all want to do that. Especially you spend a hundred bucks on gas and you know, you, you <laughs> do all this other stuff to get there, you know, uh, you want to catch fish, but, uh, there's something to be said also about just going down a, a river with white water and watching those bobbers go. And eventually one of them goes Dunk, like that. And it's like, all right, here we go. Party time. It was worth all that work, all that rowing, the rain, the, the cold, um, you know, the, the pumping the water out of the bottom of the boat during the rainstorm, all that. No, that's, it, you're right. No, it's, it's the full pie. It's not, it's not just the, yeah, no, I'm, uh, and I tell you what, I got to get back out West one of these days. It's, uh, it's probably going to be a little while though, but, uh, yeah, those rivers out there are gorgeous. Yeah. That's, uh, you guys got the mountain landscapes and all that other stuff. We're, we're just not in that same field of, uh, elevation or altitude. But yeah, yeah no, I, I will never, I, I just about broke my leg coming off one of those big glacial rocks. So you guys are just, that, those that's... are volcanic actually, but yeah. Oh, wow. Those things yeah. are, I mean, those are like, like Volkswagens out on their heads, you know? Yeah. So... Just think, think, think of what happened to get them there. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of scary. So I've got one more question um, before we wind all this down. And if it, if it can't be answered, it's, Maybe I should. Oh, fuck it. I'm going to. So yeah. the the mallard on the drunken disorderly, right? So I, I, I tie a lot of flies, right? And one fly that I don't tie a lot of um, because it's it's kind of pretty intimidating, honestly, is your fly. I've, I've tied it twice and I didn't mm -hmm. like how it turned out at mm -hmm. all. Um, the ruddering feathers, like the mallard, it's it's specifically mallard for a reason correct yeah you could do a, i've done some with guinea like when i'm doing brook trout patterns i love using some guinea fowl you know what i mean because it gets okay. that like white spot in there kind of dials it yeah. off so, yeah but yeah anything flat what you're trying to do is counter the wedges flat side to side 
which is why that hook shank is always better longer. I got away from kind of doing those short jigs because you get a dig and a wiggle, but you wouldn't get the glide. Okay. And I like the glide over the wiggle, unless I'm trying to bank grub, which is to say I need depth right off the bank, like three feet now. Outside of that, I'm, I'm, you know, the jig hooks we use a lot in the triples, those big triples we tie up to five, five out okay. rather. So, yeah. So, but, so if you, if you're fishing that kind of grubby stuff, then wouldn't lead be better? Well, yes and no. Lead has one effect. I have a fall. When I jig lead, it falls. Like I lift it and then it falls, which is very leachy and it has its effect like a sex dungeon. I fished the wheels out of that when I was a kid. And that leaching effect, I believe, was a proximity take, whereas like a leech would be falling out of fish and before it would attach, it would grab it. We have a bunch of these chestnut lampreys in Michigan. So it's a very natural response versus what we're talking about is a swim fly. A swim fly is more along the lines of like a, either a soft plastic or a plastic bait, like a rappella, in which like case you're drawing... Yeah, it's not a proximity thing so much as a sad. You're trying to draw the fish instead of kind of enter its proximity. So I think the draw of swim flies has a, has a broader um, reach um, though I will say, you know, the commitment rate of a, a leaded leech of any kind that's fallen on a fish also has a fantastic bite trigger. But the swim of a bug is based upon no lead because for that bug to go four ways to my one, I have to allow a slack and a float recovery, which is to say when I dig that wedge in, I expect three more actions when I relax it. In fact, when I fish the streamer in between the actions of burn, down swat, straight strip, lift and wiggle, whatever the case, whatever presentation I've had, I'll reach the rod back to the fly and create a, a vast amount of slack so that the fly can finish in its own right instead of me being toting on it, be it a short leader or just too taunt to the line based upon the river's bow tension current. Does that, does that fit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and so that's just getting back to the feathers that uh i mean that's painting this picture more because the wedge is that it's that kind of like linear i don't know if that would be lateral to horizontal yeah then to lateral again and then on the triple to horizontal again gotcha so okay the yeah the triple swims kind of like a like more of like a banjo minnow soft plastic style versus the drums which are more your kind of broke back repeller. They have a shake um, to them, you know, kind of like a, the, there is no feather knife in the back to tone out the swim so much as it shakes out. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so, so basically every action on the drunk is a, is a action or fight against its other, uh, its next step. So the head is flat and wide, which digs in. And then on the longer shanks, I, I really like the 4X long, the S11s by Gamma. They make a, it's a, it's a nice shank weight as far as the diameter of the hook, the weight of it. And, and when you run that back there versus some of the shorter shank um, uh, jigs, which will get you a nice shake and, and dig, because eventually you have to factor in that 26 or, or 24 or even 45 or 60 degree downs are going to enhance the dig, just like going to, you know, like the lure store and seeing all the different lips on the, the lures, the more lip you have, the more dig you get. So every D that we spin has got kind of a prescribed water flow, a water condition, or maybe even a section of river. Cause like on the white in Arkansas, we're throwing four aughts and five aught triple Ds with two handed approaches, nine weight rods and some initiative. You know what I mean? Uh, versus say if I'm fishing in some small creek in Michigan where I'm fishing upstream with a six or seven foot leader, which is short by comparison to the to 10 to 12 foot leader I would use on the white to combat that bow tension that would otherwise drown out that slack that I'm trying to enhance. Difference being is the cast on the white is 110 feet versus the one in the creek that's only about 15. Gotcha. <laughs> so that's, are you using no, fuck it. We'll we'll get into that some other time. I don't. Uh, I want to respect. Go ahead, brother. What's the question? Pop it, dude. So, are you using like short tapered lines, or are you using like really long tapered lines for 
um, let's just say if you're going to be fishing on on the white, are you trying to get Love, that? Okay, that this now, if you got, is this okay to open that can? It's a short can, but it, you got five minutes and we can do this. I, I've got time, Brian. You got okay, time? okay. Yeah. So think about it yeah. like this. So if I'm fishing the white in Arkansas, my sales space is based upon the CFS that that bull shoals has opened up, right? Yeah. Let's say they go 16K to 22K. That's big water, right? Yeah. That's 22,000 CFS coming through that pipe. Now, how many of those big trout you reckon are sitting out in the center of that river de dealing with that? Fucking none of them. They're pushing none them. of them. They're on the wall, aren't they? They're even yeah. in people's fucking yards by that point. Yep. You know? No, I'm not kidding. We catch a Just lot Just like of the Deschutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So when those fish go up there, number one, the kill switch is fully on. You do know when they crank that water up, that is the go, go, kill everything. If you find a planter bobo, it's as good as dead. That's how they react to that bump and flow. So if I'm fishing on that bank, I'm not really concerned about the center of the river. So I want a head that's only going to cater to a bank and a fishing window that might be what, 25 feet? That's yeah. it. You know he's on the wall. Why throw a 40-foot head at a fish that's being... So an, an, like a max short is yeah. perfect for that. Now, if you run into that situation where the max short is drawing too much on the inside current, then you can just go to a really strong, you know, like 25 foot, whatever in the 300 or more class, like a sniper. A sniper okay. has a lower diameter, so it's not gonna grab the current as bad. And therefore there's pros and cons with it. If, as soon as you get into a certain size fly though, when you go to add the strip tension to the fly, that lower diameter will cut back through the current, in which case you have to draw more line to get the action to the fly. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I'm on the wall, I'm automatically going to go with the max short because I don't have a lot of that line out. And I'm only fishing here. If you look at these lines, too, don't read the diagram. Some of them are kind of misrated, like the 280 grain, which is less than what a 300 grain is. But you have to remember if you take 280 grains, and put it into 16 feet versus spread it over 30. Now you have a big split shot, even though it's under 300 grains, right? Yeah. So that's perfect for sinking a big fly into a shortened sinking area to get that prescribed effect over that 25 foot area. Now, we're going to flip this a little bit. If I'm on the White River in Arkansas and I'm still throwing streamers, and let's say there's enough water to still throw streamers, let's say we're 8,000, 9,000 or better. All the way up to say that 16,000 where I would say high water kind of starts. In that realm, the sales pitch is not just off the bank anymore, is it? The sales yeah. pitch is almost to the boat. The catch with the White River in Arkansas is the game in clear water ends at about 50, 60 feet before they see the shadow of the boat. You know what I mean? You guys know how that spreads out down there. Like when that, yeah. that boat's going, there's no, there's nothing hiding you or your shadow when those fish are getting close out there. So the game stops at 50, 60 feet. So now I'm going to a 40 foot head. So that when I let the cast go, I'm letting the cast go at 60 feet and it cruises to a hundred and I go to a two handed burn and I can fish that 110 into that 50, 60 as my presentation and then reset because anything inside of that, the gig's up. The gigs up, and I've had and I've watched that streamer fishing there go from, you know, totally chic to totally geek over the span of you know the seven years we were going pretty steadily for that daytime streamer bite. But we noticed immediately. I mean, we started that those runs doing like if a boat didn't get a two footer each pass, we were doing something wrong, and and to a point now where if I had five boats with five clients hosted down there, you know, if one guy in the group got a two footer. It was like hip, hip, hooray. And I'm like, this is going the wrong direction. The only thing that didn't slip was the night stuff. What we were doing down there with spay rods and a Beetlejuice should, you know what? <clears throat> we always talk about, you know, this trout fishing and that trout fishing. This was the best. That was the best. I had this incredible bite here. I had this incredible bite there. And save some places maybe in Iceland that I have not seen enough of to warrant whether or not this is true. And I've had some good brown trout fishing experiences, but I've never had me and a buddy fish six and a half hours and get 34 of them over 20 inches in six and a half hours, breaking 24 inches seven times in one night. 
in one night, six and a half hours. So we can size up this and we can size up that streamer window and you can break it all down. By the time the smoke clears, you'll understand that the brown trout is a nocturnal one. And as soon as you dive into that rabbit hole, fuck this. I mean, the streamers are cool. I like watching them, Chase. Don't get me wrong. But I got more hope and wonder in that spay cast, you know, across the White River than I ever did or ever will. And the, the streamer bites kind of, you know, they've, they've blown that up pretty good down there now. You know, there's a lot of chatter down there. You know, I remember the first few years we were down there, if you saw somebody fly fishing, he was doing it with a midge rod and a nine foot five way for the bobo. You know what I mean? And nowadays you go there about this time of year and there's probably somebody with an eye shot chucking chicken. And, and that's different. So that's, you know, that's, it's just, they get aware. They're savvy fish, which is why I like them. They get savvy. They make you evolve, you know, so. For yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, Tommy, holy shit, this has been awesome. And dude, thanks for real right. for taking time out of your evening, man, and coming on. We're going to have to have you back on because I've got questions that I want to ask. Very so cool. <laughs> if, if you'd have it, we'd love to have you back. We'll mm -hmm. do it some other time, brother. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, Brian, you, you got anything? Speak, uh, no, I got nothing. I got, I got nothing. I, I'm gonna basically probably have a big old dip and drink a do, and probably start looking at bed because I gotta lift a whole bunch of wood in the morning. Well, Tommy, real quick, where if anybody wants to book a trip with you for your next season, or they uh, are, are you still selling flies at all, or is that just a you know, I'm kind of tying for some of my you know regular regulars but yeah. i'm not doing the i just i don't have the i just don't have the i got two boys yeah. and that's that's worth more than the yeah so understandably absolutely yeah. i get that dude if i get if i get you know and, and don't get me wrong i gotta get my boxes up to snuff i'm gonna tie some flies for the regular clients if i start reaching out there then yeah no i'm i'll just have my nice little break between now and the first of april and be an old irish hermit <laughs> <laughs> so if they uh want to get a hold of you for a trip uh the best way would probably be your website right uh yeah sure yeah the the website there and and yeah we specialize in uh you know i'm not doing the bobber trips like i have you know i i just haven't been doing that like i did but if you're into the streamers the mouse fishing the swing fishing you know really anything big fly predator stuff i'm i'm kind of i'm i'm kind of down to teach so Oh yeah. Well, everybody, you can find Tommy at thefishwhisperer.com. Uh, and you can find us at Working Class Fish on Facebook, Working Class Fishing on YouTube. We're on all your major listening platforms. You can find us on Instagram or at workingclassfishing.com. Uh -huh. um, this episode has been brought to you by all of our wonderful sponsors. Uh, we're running a little long. I'm not going to shoot all them back off, but um, please go check them out. Um, we'll have all their information, all of Tom's information in the show notes. Brian, you got anything, dude? No, that's it. And, uh, you know, Tommy, thanks again for coming on. We really Guys, appreciate thanks it. thanks for having me. That was swell of you. You know, that yeah. was, you know, swell. That was good time. Good chat. <laughs> oh we're de like john said we're definitely going to have to have you back on again and uh this was this was a great time so a lot of technical information and everything else and I we apologize. really appreciate it it's all no that's okay you know that, none of that shit's gonna work so <laughs> <laughs> right on well everybody uh thank you so much for listening make sure to leave us five star review thumbs up on youtube those do help and uh if you have any questions for us or you want to be a part of the podcast, you shoot us over at email at workingclassfish at gmail.com. But until next time, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Hope everybody has a wonderful day. Do I say bye to now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.